Hello and welcome to the Mind Map. Today we're going to be going over Daily Rituals by Mason Curry. What an amazing, amazing topic for a book. Essentially what he's done is look at the daily rituals of some of the most famous artists in the world. So this is subtitled How Artists Work. And what we're going to be going over is the rituals, the daily routines of all of these amazing artists. A really, really great book. I want to thank Mason for creating the book. And if you're someone who struggles with routine, struggles with creating things, struggles with being able to be productive at work even, this book is going to be perfect for you. And with that, let me get into the introduction. First, we're going to talk about Mason Curry himself. He's written two books, so this one was the first one, Daily Rituals, How Artists Work, and he also wrote Daily Rituals, Women at Work, which I might go over if any of you guys are interested in that. Previously, he was an editor at Metropolis and Core 77, which I believe are two different magazines. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Slate. So he's been writing for quite a bit before this, and I assume that's why he got into this topic in this subject is he wanted to kind of figure out how to optimize his own personal work, which is the reason that I create these mind maps for you guys, because I'm really interested in these things and I want to share them with you. That's the reason that I create these mind maps. So that's definitely close to my heart. Really, really big introduction here. I thought it was necessary. I'm going to go over the first quote. He says in the book, nearly every weekday morning for a year and a half, I got up at 530, brushed my teeth, made a cup of coffee and sat down to write how some of the greatest minds of the past 400 years approached this exact same task. A little bit of a, a meta note here. That is how they made time each day to do their best work. How they organized their schedules in order to be creative and productive. By writing about the admittedly mundane tasks and details of my subjects' daily lives, when they slept and ate and worked and worried, I hope to provide a novel angle on their personalities and careers to sketch the entertaining small bore portraits of the artist as a creature of habit. And if you watched my video on creativity by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, you'll realize how much artists are really just creatures of habit and something that you wouldn't necessarily think about. In fact, you might think the opposite, but it's simply not the truth. Continuing on here, he says, tell me what you eat and I shall tell you what you are. The French gastrometer, uh, I'm not even going to try, once wrote, I said, tell me what time you eat and whether you take a nap afterwards. A funny little anecdote there. My underlying concerns in this book are the issues that I struggle with in my own life. How do you make a meaningful creative work while also earning a living? Is it better to devote yourself wholly to a project or to set aside small portions of each day? And when there doesn't seem to be enough time for all you hope to accomplish, must you give things up, sleep, income, a clean house, or can you learn to condense activities, to do more in less time, to work smarter, not harder, as my dad is always telling me? More broadly, are comfort and creativity incompatible, or is the opposite true? Is finding a basic level of daily comfort a prerequisite for sustained creative work? All really great questions that I'm sure we all want answers to. I don't pretend to answer these questions in the following pages. Probably some of us, some of them can't be answered or be resolved only individually in shaky per personal compromises. But I have tried to provide examples of a variety of how brilliant and successful people have confronted many of the same challenges. I wanted to show how grand creative visions translate to small daily increments, how one's working habits influence the work itself and vice versa. So that's really great. Really, really exciting. How do great artists work? Mason researched the daily routines of 161 artists, ranging from people like W.H. Auden, Charles Darwin, Carl Jung, Stephen King, Ben Franklin, and Mozart. Inside the book, he's really just exploring what it takes to create something meaningful while still making a living. Something I'm sure all of us want to know. It's a good thing that the 161 people he researched have created some of the most meaningful works in history while devoting a great portion of their lives to it and quite often as in the case of Stephen King, Carl Jung, all of the a lot of these people made a very very good living doing it. One thing that stuck out most in this wide variety of rituals and routines of which he goes over quite a lot of them in the in the book here 
uh, each of these artists is following a different routine. Some of them are workaholics. Some of them just work to get it finished. Some of them are schedulized and ritualized, and some of them aren't ritualized and scheduled at all. It's very interesting how different each of these artists is working. But the one thing that I would say is a through line with them all is they all follow some sort of ritual. Even if it's the ritual of not being scheduled, even if it's the ritual of not having a ritual, that's a ritual in and of itself. So the first main point that I have here, and I have two of them highlighted, these are the two that I feel are the most important points of the entire book, so stay tuned for each of those. We'll get into the first one right away. The book title is Daily Rituals, but my focus in writing it was really people's routines. Now, what's the difference between a ritual and a routine? The word connotates ordinariness and even a lack of thought. To follow a routine is to be on autopilot, but one's daily routine is also a choice or a whole series of choices or a habit in a whole series of habits, as we might say. In the right hands, it can be a finely calibrated mechanism for taking advantage of a, ri a range of limited resources. For example, time, the most limited resource of all, as well as willpower, self-discipline, and optimism. A solid routine fosters a well-worn groove for one's mental energies and helps to stave off the tyranny of moods. Stave off the tyranny of moods. Have you ever woke up in the morning and just decided, ah, I just don't feel like it today. I just don't feel like doing it today. That's what routines are going to help you get through. This was one of William James' favorite subjects. He thought that you wanted to put part of your day on autopilot, part of your life on autopilot. By forming good habits, he said that we can free our minds to advance to really interesting fields of action. Ironically, James himself was a chronic procrastinator and could never stick to a regular schedule. Isn't that interesting? He thought that he needed the schedule, but he couldn't stick to it. Maybe he didn't have some of the tools that we've already talked about on this channel. Free your mind to advance to really interesting fields of action. We've talked about habits quite a lot on this channel already through a myriad of different books, including The Slight Edge, including The Compound Effect, and also including Atomic Habits by James Clear, which is one that I recommend that you go and check out. Routines are simply, to me, the stacking of multiple habits. They are something that we create to allow us to go on autopilot for a little while. By allowing part of our lives to go on autopilot, it seems as though we're able to free up our minds to think about more advanced things, more complex things. Think of it like this. Are you thinking about what you're going to have for breakfast in the morning? Or are you thinking about your next book, article, or video? That's a very important distinction because the brain needs so much time to come up with creative ideas. And if you're constantly inundated with different things, if you're constantly inundated with little choices and decisions that you have to make, there just isn't that much free time or free willpower or free energy in order for you to be able to come up with creative ideas that you're going to need if you're going to be an artist. This is something I've learned the hard way. And I expect a lot of people in the book learn the hard way as well. But if I didn't have a routine that I strictly adhere to, the days tend to get away from me, with little things clogging up my thinking, including decisions on what I have for breakfast in the morning, what I eat for lunch, and what I'm going to do first thing in the morning, what time I wake up, and etc. So now I decide on my schedule for the week, what I'm going to do, I schedule in the things that I have to do that are outside of my normal daily routine, and then the night before, I already know what every minute of my day is going to look like. I actually schedule all the way from 7 o'clock in the morning and all the way till 4.30 at night, which is the time that I usually try and shut off my electronic devices, allowing me enough freedom to do the work that I really need to be doing in the day because I don't have to make the decision. And in fact, I make the decision around 4 o'clock the day before about what I'm going to be doing the next day. And that's very, very helpful for me. Now, the next routine we're going to be looking into is the routine of Auden. Routine in an intelligent man is a sign of ambition, Auden wrote in 1958. If that's true, then Auden himself was one of the most ambitious men of his generation. The poet was obsessively punctual, and he lived by an exciting, exacting timetable throughout his life. He checked his watch over and over again, a guest wrote Auden's once noted. A guest of Auden's once noted. Eating, drinking, writing, shopping, crossword puzzles, even the mailman's arrival are all timed to the minute with accompanying routines. Now, he might be an example of someone who is an extreme 
routinized person. Autumn believed that a life of such military precision was essential to his creativity, a way of taming the muse to his own schedule. Something that Stephen Pressfield writes about quite a lot as well is this kind of scheduling and kind of taming that muse. I recommend that you go and check out The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield that I've already done on this channel. A modern Stoic, he observed, knows that the surest way to discipline, discipline passion is to discipline time. Decide what you want or ought to do during the day. Then always do it exactly at the same moment every day. And the passion will give you no trouble. So that's essentially his way of taming the muse. And again, if you want to learn more about this technique in particular, check out The War of Art. For now, we're going to talk a little bit about ambition and whether you have ambition or not. Auden says here that routine in an intelligent man or woman is a sign of ambition. I'm going to assume that you're intelligent because you're watching this mind map and there's tons of other things that less intelligent people would be doing with their time, I'm sure. Maybe that's just my own bias, I'm not sure. But think about this, you have ambition. And again, if you're here, you're watching this video about artists, I would say that you're likely to have quite a big, de a big amount of ambition. But how are your routines? That's our last thing that we could really think about. Am I intelligent? Do I have ambition? And if I'm not accomplishing what I want to accomplish, how are my routines? Sometimes I think there's a disconnect between someone's ambition and their routines. In fact, a lot of my coaching clients started our relationships without routines, or they had routines that were disjointed and different from the day to day. They have all they have all these ideas of what they want to accomplish, right? They're intelligent. They have a ton of different things that they want to do, and they have a lot of ambition to get them done, but they seem to be going nowhere. And that's often why they come to me, because they're struggling with this. And if you've ever been there before, without a routine, without a creative routine, feeling like you're stuck in place, you know how painful that is. I've been there before as well, and that's why a lot of people reach out. Quite simply, I help them set up routines for themselves. That really is all that we need to do. They're already intelligent, they're already ambitious, they already know more about whatever subject they could be asking me about than I do. They've got the intelligence and ambition covered. But having a routine for working is exact will is what will actually get things accomplished. And setting up these routines is very individual. Everyone has a different routine. For example, they have different personalities, different times, and type of work. So I can't just give them my structure for the day and expect them to follow it, because that's not how it works. But the one thing that's constant is the process of building habits and stacking them that allows us to create a high quality routine. And that's exactly what I do with my coaching clients. If you're interested in testing out a free coaching session, there's a link down below, 45 minutes free with me. And if this is something that you're struggling with, I'll help you create a routine. Next person we're gonna be talking about is Carl Jung. Now I have a lot of, a great deal of respect for Carl Jung. I wanted to do mind maps on his books before, but they are so, so in depth. I'm thinking I'm gonna have to practice for quite a long time before I feel comfortable enough being able to bring you a Carl Jung mind map. But let me know down below if you're interested in seeing that and I'll work even harder towards it. The quote from the book says, in 1992, Carl Jung bought a parcel of land near the small village of Bollingen, Switzerland, and began construction on a simple two-story stone house along the shore of the upper basin of Lake Zurich. Continuing on, he says, over the next dozen years, he modified and expanded the bowling tower, as it became known, adding a pair of smaller auxiliary towers in a walled-in courtyard with a large outdoor fire pit. Even with those additions, it remained a primitive dwelling. No floorboards or carpets covered the uneven stone floor. There was no electricity and no telephone. Heat came from chopped wood. Cooking was done on an oil stove and the only artificial light came from oil lamps. Water had to be brought up from the lake and boiled, and eventually a hand pump was installed. If a man in the 16th century were to move into the house, only the kerosene lamps and the matches would be new to him, Young wrote. Otherwise, he would know his way around without difficulty. And I'm sure a lot of you are on here probably saying, wow, that sounds like a great place to live or a great place to be creative, and I would have to agree with you. Throughout the 1930s, Young used the tower as a retreat from the city, where he led a workaholic's existence, seeing patients for eight or nine hours a day and delivering frequent lectures and seminars. As a result, nearly all Young's writing was done on holidays, and although he had many patients who relied on him, Young was not shy about taking time off. I've realized that somebody who's tired and needs a rest 
and goes on working all the same is a fool, he said. And this is a great point for just a word on relaxing. Jung said that somebody who's tired and needs a rest and goes on working all the same is a fool. How many of us have fall, fallen into this category before in our life? The category of a fool. I know at many times in my life, specifically earlier on in my entrepreneurial journey, I would just keep working, keep working, keep working, no matter how much I needed a rest. And that's why I and Young both believe that it's important to have a routine, not only around work, but also around rest. Now, I don't think that you need to build a hut outside of Lake Zurich or anything similar to that in order to accomplish it, but I mean to each their own. If you want to do that, go right ahead. Instead, I think it's simply about asking yourself, how can I routinize and ritualize my rest? Actually, I think Dale Carnegie, of which I just did his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People on the channel, says it's important to rest before you need it. So how can you schedule rest into your day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month routine instead of just, when I'm really tired, I'll take a rest? That's not an effective way of resting. This is one part of the routine I think most people miss, and it's also one of the reasons so many people have a hard time sticking to a routine. They simply create a routine that is impossible to follow over the long haul without thinking about their need for rest. So many people, I can't tell you how many people. Now, there's a certain type of person, like I said before, that comes to me that doesn't have a routine, but also there's another type of person who has the ambition, has the intelligence, and has the routine, but they don't realize their need for rest. Here's how I schedule rest. First, during my workday, this is my day-to-day scheduling of rest. I don't focus on one thing for too long. 60 minutes per task is my max, if possible. Now, I might spend 60 minutes reading and then 60 minutes mind mapping the same book, but that's two separate tasks. And I do that because my mind, for whatever reason, might be different than yours, really has a hard time working on the same thing for 60 minutes at a time. Second thing that I do during my workday is I work only in 20 minute deep work blocks with a five minute break. Now, if you're a speed reader and a speed mind mapper, you know that 20 minutes is about all that you can handle at any one time, as far as taking in information or putting out other information. Third is I make sure that my weekends are not only work-free, but also I try to go 100% tech-free on Sundays. And more often than not, I'm successful, although sometimes I do fail because I have to talk to my friends on, on text to coordinate some things. But fourth, I try to schedule at least a week of vacation, once every quarter. I really, I I think for my first three years as an entrepreneur, I didn't take one week of vacation. And what what a terrible, terrible existence that was. Surprisingly, this is when I get my best thinking done. I guess me and Young are similar that way. And of course, I'm a huge, huge fan of Carl Young, so I really, really enjoy him. Next, we have Gould. I work all the time. The evolutionary biologist and writer Stephen Jay Gould told an interviewer in 1991. I work every day, I work weekends, and I work nights. Some people, looking at that from the inside, might use the modern term workaholic or might see this as obsessive or destructive. But it's not work to me. It's just what I do. That's my life, and I also spend a lot of time with my family. And I sing, and I go to ball games. And you can find me in my season seat at Fenway Park as often as, well, I don't don't mean I have a a one-dimensional life, but I basically do work all the time. I don't watch television, but it's not work. It's not work. It's my life. It's what I do. It's what I like to do. So you can see this is very interesting. We have a very interesting juxtaposition, or it might appear to be a juxtaposition between what Young said up here and what Ghoul is saying down here. But what you'll notice is that actually Young talked about how he is a workaholic when he is at work. So it's very, very interesting to see that it's not necessarily how hard can I... Most people live their lives as how little work can I do so that I can relax all the time. But there's also the opposite side of it. How hard can I work so I can work hard all the time and get what I want? But what I'm offering here is... How hard can I work so that when I rest, I can really deeply rest? And it's kind of the dichotomy that's there. When you're resting, you should rest very deeply, not think about work. And when you're working, you should work very deeply and not think about rest. 
Here's an interesting point that I, I came up with while I was reading this. What is work really? I'm going to focus more on the love of work more than working deeply because you can watch my mind map on deep work by Cal Newport if you want to learn more about deep work. But people who aren't creatives often can't comprehend how someone can enjoy work. Most people who have to go to regular jobs see work as a chore, something just to get finished, which when you don't love your work, it probably is a chore. That's the secret of true productivity. Love what you're doing. Easier said than done, right? Something one of my mentors shared with me is the principle of prepare for what's next. And it's a great way for you to start loving what you do on your day-to-day, even if it sucks. So here's how you do it. Whenever you have something to do that's boring, tedious, or otherwise not enjoyable, find a way that doing this now can prepare you for what's coming next. Whatever your next is, maybe it's something creative, meaningful, and important to you. Even the most boring thing you do can help you get through some of those tough times of being a creative. For example, if you have a very boring project to do at work that's going to take you an entire day, well, when you're being creative, there's going to be entire days where you have to do things that are boring. You're going to have to edit something. You're going to have to do things that you don't enjoy doing and that you're not good at. So you can find a way to say, this is going to help me create something meaningful and important in my life next. Find how you can learn from what you're doing and how you can connect it to what's coming next for you. Now let's give you a quick story of a coaching client and how I used this with her. Karen was struggling at her day job. She came to me to find a way to make a living as a creative or as an entrepreneur, which I was more than happy to help with. I've been an entrepreneur for over 10 years and there are a ton of different ways to make a living doing something meaningful. But Karen had student debt that she needed to pay off. So quitting, I think she had about $20,000 in student loan debt, which for some of you is going to be crazy. And for some of you will probably be the norm or even less than the norm. So quitting your job was living off the savings just wasn't an option. It's not, it's not possible for her. The day job was killing her. She was bored literally all the time. So we decided to do two things and we came to this together. So whenever I'm in a coaching relationship, I try not to tell people what to do. Instead, I ask some questions to get them to think a little differently about their situation. And this is what we came up with. First was to get a good idea of what she might want to do next or create something business-wise because that's what she wanted to do. Second, we decided that every time she felt negatively about something that she was doing at work, she would resolve to find how it was contributing to what was coming next for her. And we made that a habit. Every time she felt negatively about something at work, she said, how is this preparing me for what's coming next? That became a habit for her. That made her days much easier to bear, made it much easier to go through her day-to-day doing some of those boring things at work, but knowing that it was going to lead to something that was coming up next. That's one way that you could go about it. So we've had three routines, of which there's 161 in the book. I recommend that you check out the book because there might be a routine in there that sounds more like your life than any one of these ones. So I recommend that you pick that up. But the main message from the book that I wanted to get across is to find your own. Although he was a creature of habit, Malamud was wary of placing too much importance on his particular work rituals. He told an interviewer, there's no way, there's too much drivel about this subject. You, you're who you are, not Fitzgerald or Thomas Wolfe. You write by sitting down and writing. There's no particular time or place. You suit yourself, your nature. How one works, assuming he's disciplined, doesn't matter. If he or she is not disciplined, no sympathetic magic will help. The trick is to make the time, not steal it, and produce the fiction, or produce the work. If the stories come and you get them written, you're on the right track. Eventually, everyone learns his or her own best way. The real mystery to crack is you. So essentially what he's saying is, you have to create your own routine. And maybe you came to this book expecting to have a distillation of all the routines so that you could come up with a master routine of what you needed to do to become great, like a lot of these artists. But that's just not how it works. Routines are important, but they are also specific to the person. So find your own routine, create the habits, and stack them together. Get to work and create that art that you need to create. I want to thank you for being with me here today. And I will see you in the next mind map.